And now, <laughs> the worldwide phenomenon. One records in Stowe Market, the other records in Houston. Alex Moss, Burton DeWitt, join forces to bring you <laughs> the weekly Dartcast 180. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Weekly Darts Cast. I'm Alex Moss and joining me is, of course, my co-host, Darts Statistician and the Strava PB machine. Burton DeWitt, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'm still recovering from my run on Sunday, but otherwise doing fine. How are you, Alex? Good to hear. Yeah, I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Lots to get into. We've got four pro tours from last week to catch up on the, the Women's Series coming to an end at the weekend. We'll also be looking ahead to the World Series finals, delving into a little bit of news as well. A couple of guests as well for you, but... Let's start, I guess, at the beginning of last week. We had the latest Super Series titles for Dimitri Vandenberg, Callum Rids, Rob Cross and Michael Smith. But out of those four players, whose title win most impressed you last week? Yeah, and for all four of them, it was their second title of the season. Uh, three of them, of course, second Pro Tour title as well. Uh, for Rob Cross, he also has a major that he won just a few days earlier, uh, but second of all sorts in the PDC for all four of them. As for who impressed me the most... I mean, Rob Cross is the obvious answer because not just did he win a title, but he was brilliant all week and he was brilliant the previous weekend, although not as brilliant as he was in the pro tours, but pretty darn close in winning the European championship. And it seems like all he was missing was confidence and he's not missing that anymore. But if we're talking just the title win itself, just that one day, I'm not going to say Rob Cross because as good as he was, Dimitri Vandenberg on the first day was just incredible. And it was really Michael Van Gerwen at his best ask because it wasn't just, you know, a big performance. It was seven matches, six of which were over the ton. The other, which wasn't that bad, in succession, averaging 103 for the day on the way to the title. The only match where he was under the ton was the match that went to a decider against Vincent Vandervoort, who I'll come to in the next question. But that was the only match where he was under a ton. He averaged 98 and a half. And what did he do in that match? He was 5-3 down, and he averaged nearly 113 over the last three legs to turn that one around. That's the only match over the day where he was under a ton. He was over 104 in the last 16 quarterfinal and semifinal and still averages a ton against Adrian Lewis in the final coming again from behind from four nil down to win it, winning eight of the last nine legs. It was just from start to finish a brilliant day from him where he played at a level that, as I said, was Michael Van Guren esque from Michael Van Guren four or five years ago. Now, I'm not meaning to compare him to MVG at MVG's best because MVG at MVG's best not just did this one day, would do this the entire week and win three of the four and get upset in a last leg decider in the semifinal, averaging 109 the other day. Dimitri Vandenberg didn't follow up at that level over the following three days. But that's not what this question asks. So it was whose title win impressed you the most? And it has to be Dimitri because it was, as I said, a day that very few people have had before. Very few will have again since. And it culminated with him lifting the title with 103 average for the day with his weak match still being nearly a ton and 113 over the last three legs in that one anyway. I can't argue with that. It is difficult to pick anyone else from those four, especially when you just mentioned there what Dimitri Vandenberg did on that first day of the Super Series last week and the averages. The lowest was just the, the 98. And as you say, the way he came back in that game against Vincent van der Voort, the 13, 12, 15 dart legs from 5-3 down to win the game. And it wasn't just how well he played, but how well his opponents played as well. Like, okay, you take out his first round game against Boris Koltsov, who, let's give him some credit, he took out 142 in the first leg, but from 2 all, Dimitri pulled away and, and won that game. But you look at the averages from his opponents, Andrew Gilding, 103, Vincent van der Voort, 97, Chris Doby, 101, Rob Cross, 103, Kim Hybrex, his, his Belgian World Cup teammate, 102, and then Adrian Lewis, 95. So even though he's playing at a top level, he's having to do it against players that are also playing at a top level as well, which makes it even more impressive. But also you factor in as well that Dimitri Vandenberg's not had the best time of it in the last few months since he made the final of the world match play. He lost out to Fallon Cherokee, had that big lead in the World Series. And we had Keith Deller on the show a few weeks ago and we were talking about that event. And he said 
how does Dimitri van der Berg bounce back from that? Because when you have such a big lead in the semi-final on TV and you've got a chance to win the title that weekend, it can take a, a while. But he's come back brilliantly, hasn't he, to win the floor title last week and the, the way he did it as well. So for me, I, I can't really look beyond Dimitri van der Berg. But I will give a mention to the three other winners as well. Callum Ridd's his average in the final was 90. But aside from that, it was high 90s, low 100s. And he had a couple of really good comebacks as well. He was... I think 3-0 down to Jose de Souza, won it 6-4, 3-0 down to Gabriel Clemens in the final and, and came back and, and won that final 8-6. And he's a player that we've spoken quite a bit about this year because he is starting to really shoot up the rankings and he's potentially going to be in the top 32 inside two years of having his tour card, which not many players are able to do, and especially players at his age as well. We did have our Royal Cross Appreciation Minute on the show last week and we are going to hear from his manager, Rab Boehner, a little bit later on as well. So I'll, I'll save the, the Rob Cross appreciation for, for now. But again, great to see him continuing to play well and, and getting another title, his first floor title since 2018. It's been a, a little while. He seems to just pick up major titles and, and doesn't worry about the floor events. But he's got another one under his belt. And then finally, Michael Smith, again, who had a, a bit of a ropey first round game. But aside from that, performed very, very well for the, for the rest of it. Came through a couple of deciders and... Can he get that that big title? Well, you continuing to pick up the floor title, so the confidence should be back heading into these last couple of months. Now, we talked about those four title winners at the Super Series in Barnsley, but did anyone else um, who might not have been able to cross the line and win one of the four events uh, catch your eye? I've got to say quite a few players that did impress over the, the four days in Barnsley, and I'll, I'll start off with when we spoke on our last show, we were looking ahead to this lot of pro tour events, the penultimate lot before the cutoff for the World Championship, the Players' Championship finals, and a lot on the line with tour cards, with the spot in those two major events at the end of the season. And we were saying which players are going to be able to step it up, push themselves into contention. We saw a couple of players put themselves in provisional spots for the World Championship. Ryan Meikle got to a quarterfinal on one of the days, beat some top players on the way. Brendan Dolan, Luke Humphreys, Jason Heaver, another player that's pushed himself into the spots. He's a new tour card holder for this year. And Florian Hempel, who we seem to be talking about quite regularly now on the show, he had that great win against Peter Wright in the European Championship. Probably didn't get as much credit as he deserved for that win, I don't think, because a a lot of the talk after the game was how Peter Wright was using a a set of darts, which you could probably only describe as coming free with a a dartboard from an Argos catalogue, because we've never seen darts like that on TV for a very long time and didn't perform like we know he can, but Florian got the win on that occasion. And it's a player that... He missed quite a lot at the start of the year. He's so he's missed, I think, 12 of the 27 players' championships. We've had a lot of them during the first half of the year. He's now starting to play on the tour more regularly. And he's in the World Championship spots. And I think it will be well-deserved him to get into the, the World Championship, considering what he's done these last four or five months. He has really pushed it on. And he's losing with some big averages as well. 106 average. He lost in the first round one day. Lost a, a 99 average in, in one of the days as well. But then managed to, to cap off the week with a, a run to the semi-final. So he's going to be heading up the, the rankings very, very quickly. I think we will see him in the top 64 very soon. And then it's how far can he go? Can he make that top 32? But a, a player that I'm really looking forward to seeing what he can do over the next few months. And one other I'll give a mention to, and a player that I'm sure you, you've been rooting for this year. He's not had too much luck so far. He's lost a lot of tight games. But Danny Baggish winning his, his first board of the year on the Players' Championship event, which was uh, nice to see as well. Yeah, Danny Baggish, I was going to throw him in as the last person I mentioned as well. So might as well start with him as well. He didn't qualify for the World Series event on the Monday, but played well in both his matches. And after struggling the first two days, he was in the bottom quarter of the field on each day in terms of his average. Upped it to being in the top quarter for the last two days, including, as you mentioned, winning his first board of the season. And I said at the beginning of the year, I thought he was one of those players who was going to need time to find his feet. Well, I couldn't say I was right before this weekend because... Who knows if he'll ever find his feet? Some players spend their two years on tour without doing it. But this week was the first real signs that he was starting to find his game, starting to be able to play well, and starting to get results. So that did catch my eye. I said, I would, though he was the last person I was going to mention, um, I don't think I'll do everyone else in backwards order. I'll go mm-hmm. in the order I was intending uh, for the remainder of the players. I hinted at one of these in the last question, and that's Vincent Vandevoort. And He's been very quietly having, well, a good few years now, because after he questionably considered retirement, questionably might have just been saying that the injuries might have been too much and he didn't think he qualified for anything anymore, depending on how you interpret it, what he was saying. 
whatever it was, when he lost to Max Hopper the World Championships a few years ago, it looked like his career was almost done. But he bounced back, and he's made the last three world match plays. We don't talk about him that much. But this week was really just one of those weeks yet again where he just continued to get results and continued to play well. It was top 20, 25 in averages across the week with the exception of the second day where he struggled the other three days he played really well we mentioned him losing that tough match to dimitri vandenberg but he was the only person who gave vandenberg a game that day because of how uh dimitri was playing and it was just another one of those weeks that were might have been quiet because you don't other than a quarter final he didn't go that far but he won his board twice and reached another board final and even won a match on the day where he played poorly. That's a good result and a good return for the week for Vincent van der Voort. I have two other players I'll mention. I'll try to get through them quickly. One's the beaten finalist, Ross Smith. Easy to miss just how good Ross Smith is playing. Because, okay, he made the final, so obviously he's playing well. But he averaged over the last three days 100 over a significant number of matches over those three days. Not many players can do that. You look last year over the course of the year, only a couple players averaged 100, only a couple others, including Devin Peterson, who's been struggling this year, averaged close to the 100 for the year. Ross Smith, though, played at that standard for three days, including making his making another final, his third of his career to go along with that title. And it's just he's really looking a top 32 player now, maybe even a top 24. And the last player I'll mention, I started with a Belgian on the last question. I'll end with a Belgian on this one. Kim Hybrox qualifying for the World Series event on the Monday, the World Series final, I should say, on the Monday, and then followed it up with yet again, just a really, really good, complete week, finishing in the top. 12 and averages on three of the four days and winning a bunch of matches, making a semifinal, winning another board on another day. He entered the week, as I if you remember back last week, I mentioned he's a, one of those players who needed a week to make sure he stayed in the field for the world championships. That's no longer a question. He's no longer a doubt to miss the world championships. He's no longer a doubt to miss the players championship final. He's now in the provisional field for the match play last year. Oh, sorry, next year. And playing like he did this past week, you you would think he's going to get back there after missing it this year. And I'm missing it two of the last three years. Obviously, he'll have to keep on from what he did this past week. But this was the best I've seen him play in a very long time. He looked like the player who was a Premier League player a few years ago. And even when he was in the Premier League, he didn't look like a Premier League player. He did before that, but not that year and not since. This is the first time in quite some time he really caught my eye and really looked like the player that we know he is. Now we'll move on to our first guest on this week's show. He's the manager of the newly crowned European Championship winner, Rob Cross, and the manager also of the former BDO World Youth Champion, Leighton Bennett. Here's our chat with Rab Bain. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the darts manager, Rab Bain. Thanks for the time, Rab. How are you doing? Not too bad. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Nice to chat to you, and it's a long-running feature on our show is the Rob Cross Appreciation Minute, but it's been more like an appreciation week for Rob winning the European Championship and then a pro tour during this week. What's the last week been like in the Rob Cross camp? Uh, relieved, I always say, to be honest with you. Um, it's been a long time, but for me personal, being so close to him, seeing him every day, every week, you know, it, it's been it's been coming for a long time because he's been playing really well over the last six, seven, eight months, you know what I mean? But just not ever took his chances because his finishing has not been as sharp as it has been over the last 10 days, you know? Well, we'll come back to Rob in a moment, but on to yourself. When did you first get interested in darts? Was it from a young age or more recently? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it started way, it started way back, believe it or not, uh, when I was 16. I choked for uh, Eric uh, at the time, one of the best upcoming players in the world at 17 year old. Um, choked him, come down to the local club, played 32 players, 1,001, beat the 32 players, and then uh, invited me out for a meal that night, and uh, the rest is history, basically. I've known Eric for, for 40 odd years until he passed away there a couple of years, sadly. You know, um, I started then obviously playing myself, this and the other, I was a good player at a younger age. Of, 14, 15 myself and that and wanted to be a professional practicing four or five days you know uh, four or five hours every day every week as such and uh, played Super League etc unfortunately um, won, won uh, into a big final in the NDA uh, National Championships there in 1980 but sadly broke my neck in a, in a serious car accident which basically finished my so-called career as wanting to be a, a darts player myself you know 
there's plenty to to unpack there. Firstly, with uh, with Eric though, I mean, there must be uh, plenty of, of stories during your time with him on the road. Is there any that you can share with us? Uh, well, you know, he was just he was just Eric. Eric was Eric, as I said. I, you know, I've known, known him for forty odd years. Spent a lot of time, a lot of time with him, and you know, he. His attitude towards the game was just amazing. It, it, it didn't matter. He just turn up in a tournament in the morning. I'm going to win this, and uh, and he did. You know what I mean? Um, seen 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 such such highs, such such lows, such, such a sad time when he got the dark eyes, basically, which finished his career. You know, um, and, and no longer could compete. Basically, I'll never I'll never accept the day that he. he, he Sponsored Phil Taylor and brought him into the game because it ruined it for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think that I think that's the worst thing he ever done in his life, to be honest. <laughs> um, but yeah, great, great man, great player, great confidence. You know, I mean, you learn you learn a lot. You learn a lot. I mean, the days that I used to stand behind him and, and say Phil, Cliff, you know, Lloyd, a lot of them. I mean, you know, good friends of them all from the very early age of eighteen, nineteen, twenty. You know. Um, and basically, as I said, you know, going back to Rainbow Street and Kensington, British Open, I used to play in that as well. You're playing against these great players, and then 40 odd years later, you're still you're still involved in darts. You know, it, it's it's a privilege, and to see the standards getting so much better over the years. You know what I mean? It's just it's just amazing now to just watch at these pro tours and that. It's just crazy mental standards. You know, mental. You know. Yeah, it's great to watch. And unfortunately, as you said, your uh, promising career got cut short. So, how important and how good has it been for you to still be involved in darts all these years later? It's it's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic, Alex. I mean, as I said, you know, when when uh, when I I stopped playing, I thought, oh, you know, I'll start sponsoring a few players, and that started in the early early eighties, and that with players, you know, like um, Dennis Avent, Chris Mays, Mason, Della. You know what I mean, Alex Roy. You know, and um, as I said, that's Rob on the phone now. Or something. And uh, yeah, and 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 then obviously I, I took a rest from the game for four or five years. You know, done it for so long, and then I thought, you know, I'm going to get back into it, and I, I decided to get back into it. And um, it was nice turning up at Ali Pali, um, the likes of Wayne, 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 and John Parr. And everybody was so pleased to see me, which was great. Matt Porter, you know, and and, and um, got back into the sponsorship from there, basically, you know. Um, so didn't really, didn't ever saw it. Don't, doesn't feel as all been away that long, you know what I mean? As, as May said, funny enough, being being involved for so many years, I, I've forgotten more about darts than people know about darts. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, and I can now take that, that, that experience and confidence to uh, Rob and I'll also give it to, to, to Leighton which I'm so excited to see how he gets on next year in, in, in the Q school you know definitely yeah I want to touch on Leighton as well and you took over as uh, as Rob Cross's manager I believe last year after his previous manager stepped away from darts but what was your involvement with Rob before then because you'd worked together for a little while before then hadn't you yeah yeah I mean uh, again you know true story basically there in uh, 2017 and I was in Clapham with Eric doing an exhibition and um, uh, Chris Sargent come up to me and he said hello Rob blah blah he said uh, do you want to sponsor my mate get involved with my mate and I said uh, who's that and he said Rob Cross my exact words never heard of him <laughs> and I've, ne- I've never heard of him then he ain't no good you know um, and Eric looked to me and yeah. Waste of time, and this was the same. <laughs> this was this was in March uh, 2017, and sure, sure, I uh, I watched him in the match play. I think it was the first time I seen against Adrian Lewis, and I thought to myself, "Wow, this boy can play." I loved the confidence, you know. And uh, at that stage, I then had a bet on him to win the world championship. Uh, and guess what? He won the world. <laughs> he won the world championship. You know, uh, he's first to ten, which is crazy to think that he'd only been playing or been a professional for about six or seven months. You know. And I actually then rang up Eric that that evening and said, "You've got the, you've got England's answer to Michael Van Gerwen." Yeah. And he said, "What a player, right? What a player." You know. And. Uh, Expectations weren't as good as we thought they were going 
going to be in 2018, you know. I got a phone call from uh, Nevada Sports and said, do you want to, we want you to be involved with Rob. We'd like to have you on board. Um, I met Rob the first time at the Masters. I think the first leg checked out in 153. I thought, here we go, this is what he's good at. <laughs> but then he had a disaster from there. You know, he got beat by Mensa. Um, and he really struggled. I think just basically to take on board what has actually happened. Young boy, electrician, one one day, woke up the following day, you know what I mean, so to speak, and uh, world champion, you know what I mean? World's your oyster, you know? And uh, as I said, but uh, he, he, he's getting back, he's getting back slowly, and to think that basically, as I said, where he's been, and, and now he's winning, he's still winning majors. Amazing, amazing, Alex, you know? Definitely is. Well, back to you. We've had a, a few different managers on the show before and some will travel to all of the events. Some prefer to follow from afar. What's your current arrangement? Do you do the tour with Rob? I do everything. I do I do basically everything with him. Um, however, we did go to Gibraltar. Um, and unfortunately, a couple of people picked up uh, the dreaded COVID. And I was asked basically then to self-isolate, even though I had two jabs. And I said, to me and Rob's decision basically that I stayed away just in case I passed it around the players' room, you know, to other players. And that was just a decision I took. I was perfectly fine myself. Um, but uh, it was nice to have the rest, to be honest with you, mm-hmm. you know. And you also manage Leighton Bennett, the, the former BBO World Youth Champion. How did it come about you being his manager and Leighton one of the most exciting well, young prospects in the game? Again, again, we just sort of like hit it off. Um, John uh, Navarro Sports managed him, as I said. Sadly, they pulled out. Fantastic company. Um, they wanted to get away from darts, basically. And the potential, the potential of Leighton is just, is just amazing, Alex. People don't, don't realise how good he is. And, I'm, uh, and I really will say this. I get sick and tired of people saying to me on the tour every week, every month. It's like, yeah, yeah, but when he gets a girlfriend, you know, <laughs> and this, that and the other, and he starts going out with his friends and that. I said, look, the boy's practising seven days a week. You know, he'll play in a tournament in, in Wales and travel back and play Super League the same day. You know what I mean? He'll play in the JDC Tour on the Sunday Advanced Tour, win that, then travel three or four hours back to Lincolnshire. He's only up the road from me. And then he'll play in the Super League in the evening. The guys the, the guys are phenomenal. Talent. People won't realise it really is until they actually see him yeah, live on the TV. You know what I mean? Um, and we just got a great relationship. I G him up. I stand. He just all oh, Leighton says the same. Do you believe it or not? It's, they're, they're like they're like chalk and cheese. Him and Rob because they get on so well. I'm looking at my favourite photograph above my table here. Rob and Rob and Leighton together. You know, in Frankfurt there and that. Um, they both say stand behind me because they thrive on the eye to eye contact and you G them up. You know what I mean? And Le- Le- Leighton's the same. I mean, last year, I think last year, he before there, when he when he won the uh, the world, when he got to the final against Keane in the World Youth Championship, we went out that morning. Let's go for a practice from morning to evening. I will just put it actually on social media. From morning to evening, Alex, that boy hit fifty six hundred and eighty that day. Okay, that's just like what? He's only fourteen. And as we're walking out, I said, I don't want any eye to eye contact with Keane. And we got in the car, and we just. Looked at each other and thought, yes, right, fantastic, job done. Let's get ready for the World Championship. But unfortunately, he met a fantastic player in Young Kings. We've got a, fan, got a really good relationship now because I, I, I love Target Dart and I, do a, I, I try to support all the boys from Target, the young boys like Louis Williams. I give them advice when I'm on the Pro Tour because I think they need it. They, they, they you know, they, they just uh, need to concentrate on, on, them, on what they're doing. You know what I mean? And don't worry about the opposition. Because as you said, and I said previously, the standard is crazy and mental in the game at present. And I remember being at Lakeside and, and watching Leighton win that BDO World Youth title and Rob was there too. How much of a help has Rob been, as I guess, a, a mentor for, for Leighton in these early days of his career? Yeah, yeah. Rob, Rob just gives him fantastic advice. You know, I mean, a, a good little story. We went to Frank, We went to Frankfurt. And uh, in front of 1,200 people in an exhibition. And Rob, uh, late drew Phil Taylor. And he was practicing with Rob. And he kept on getting bounce outs. And I looked over and I said, 
said, right. I said, you have to start switching. If you don't switch, you have 120 on the floor or you can have 114 on your score. What do you want to do? And to that point, he started switching downstairs. 134, 137, 136. And guess what? Hardly any bounce hurts. He went on the stage. I said to him, kick off quick. Phil doesn't like to be hit hard. He doesn't like the short format. He went on the stage and he smashed Phil a bit. And I mean smashed Phil a bit. And Phil won't let me see that. He come running upstairs, give me the biggest hug ever, before his mum and dad, you know? <laughs> and it made me so proud. And I thought, wow, future champion in the making all day long. And that's how good young lady is, you know? 1,200 people, you know, and beating the 15, 16-child world champion. I mean, it's, yeah, unbelievable. What a talent. But Rob's got a great head for it. As I said, well, Rob will ring him up. Like, he rings me up and that. We'll talk, talk to him and we'll ring him up when me and Rob's on tour. Well done, Leighton. And this, that, and the other. But uh, really, really looking forward to challenge school. Uh, Q school uh, next January there, of which then 16. We've been waiting for that for like two years, Alex. You know, it's, it just seems to have been ages and ages. Can't wait till I'm 16. Can't wait till I'm 16. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, you've only got 24 months. You've only got 22. You've only got 18. You've only got 17. And it's been like that for the last yeah. couple of years, you know. A long time coming, well, nearly there. And let's get back to Rob. A lot of talk heading into the European Championship last weekend about how he could potentially drop down the, the rankings if he had a, a bad weekend, but he goes and wins the title. How impressed were you with how Rob did in Austria going all the way to the title? Well, this is what, this is what I'm saying to managers, media, friends and colleagues that I'm more impressed with Rob that he's gone there Defending £120,000, 24th in the world, out of everything. And as he said, had the coke in us basically, <laughs> do it on stage, yeah, at the right time. He'd done, every, he'd done everything at the right time. And he, and he had a wee bit of luck. You know, Michael come up to me and grabbed me around the throat <laughs> at the championship on the Tuesday. And I won't say what he said, but it started with you lucky, okay? <laughs> And basically, I went, I thought you played well, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, I said, you was phenomenal against Gerwin and, and, and Nathan. I said, but you just didn't, didn't hit your doubles in the final, which I'm very happy to say he didn't, you know? But Rob was, Rob was never in trouble. He was never behind in the five games he played. And people have got to realise that. He knows how to win major titles. The exciting times for Rob now as well. And, and lastly, as a manager, you go through the highs and lows that your players go through. But what's the best thing about being a darts manager? Nothing, personally. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 it's the, the whole the whole team, the whole team, Jordy, Mike, Kim. You know, we're all behind. We're all behind him. His family, yeah, everybody, target darts, and we've been wanting it so badly. And Rob knows that. And Rob's selfish. He, he done. Rob's. Rob wanted to win for the team and more yeah, more than so himself, you know? Um, and, you know, I'm, sit, I'm sitting there and the relationship's fantastic. I just thought, you know, 6-4, 3-2, 6-4, then he broke and I'm thinking, see, we think alike, I'm thinking, you know, I don't really want to go into a third break. We can win this 5-0. We mm -hmm. can get this 11-4, you know? <laughs> and, and the closer Michael gets, I'm thinking, oh no, it's going to start going wrong in a minute. You know what I mean? But to win, but to win it, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I thought, wow, what an achievement! You know what an achievement for where he's been, not winning anything and defending money, saying something itself, and to, and to then be so so tired, travel back three in the morning on the Monday to get back to Barnsley, and then drive four hours from Heathrow, you know, and then. To perform in, in, the, in the, the players' championship, you know, last day, last 16, winner, last four, uh, Alex, you know yourself, that's just incredible. That's an incredible 10 days by anybody's standards, you know. Yeah, it's been a, a fantastic week for Rob and, and well-deserved and congratulations on the big win and we wish Rob, yourself and, and Leighton, of course, when he plays Q School next year, all the very best and for the rest of the year and thanks very much for joining us. Thanks very much for having me on, Alex. Much appreciated. Thank you, sir. Thanks again to Rab for joining us now on to the Women's Series, which completed the week of darts in Barnsley last week. Lisa Ashton and Fallon Shirk securing 
Ali Pali return to the end of this year. Will this be the first year that both ladies win their first match at the PDC World Championship? I mean, until we see the draw, uh, I'm just guessing. But there's not a player that either of those two could draw that they couldn't beat. And there isn't a player, I'll go a step further, there isn't a player any of either of them could draw that it would be that much of a surprise for them to beat. This one that would be a decent bit of a surprise, depending on who's in the top 32. I mean, you look at players who right now are just outside or just barely inside the top 32 who would take some beating. Um, Adrian Lewis is just outside. Callan Ritz is just outside. Ross Smith is just outside. Um, just inside is Kim Hybrock. All players that we've mentioned other than Adrian Lewis, although we could have mentioned Adrian Lewis. He just made a final in this past week. But all players that we either did or could have mentioned for being playing really well right now and are probably playing at a level higher than Lisa Ashton or Fallon Sherrick are currently at. But on the other side of the coin, on their day, they are definitely – capable of beating them and beating them three sets to nil. But it's going to depend who they draw and how they play on the given day. Lisa Ashton was a little inconsistent at the weekend. She was went out early a few times, but also she might have a little bit less confidence right now than Fallon Sherrick because she's taken a bit of a beating on the pro tour this year. She, not that she had great results last year. She had some and she, you know, made a board final back near the back end of the year and had some good scalps, but still hasn't fully found her feet on the pro tour. She, she can beat anyone on a given day, but more often than not, she is going out. Fallon Sherrick hasn't been taking those beats and just came through a World Series event in Copenhagen where she made the final and came within a few legs of lifting the title. So obviously playing with more confidence right now and at times just playing with more consistency than Lisa Ashton. And that consistency is what makes Fallon such a difficult draw for anyone. Lisa, we know her A game can beat anyone in the world. And if she brings it, then she'll win it for the first time on the Alley Valley stage, at least unless her opponent also brings um, his I don't know. Until we see the draw, I don't know. But you do have the two best women in the world competing. And that's the first time that we've been able to say that. No offense to some of the qualifiers in past years. But Dita Hedman wasn't the second best or best woman last year. And Anastasia de Bromislova, while she for a long time was the best woman in the world, as was Dita Hedman, if you go back uh, 15, 20 years, um, arguably she was the best or second best. Um, but Anastasia is not the player she was a decade ago. This year we have the two best. And therefore, the expectations should be that they do bet as well or better than they've ever done before. Yeah, I'm going to come back to that best in the world as far as the, the ladies players in the next question. But I think I agree. We do have the, the two best ladies currently in the game that have got those two spots at the World Championship at Ali Pali at the end of the year. Lisa Ashton, Fallon Sherrick, and they did continue to dominate over the weekend, maybe not as dominant as they were in the first weekend, we did see Makuri Suzuki win the, the last title of the weekend. But aside from that, we saw Fallon win three more titles. Lisa pick up a couple of titles as well. And they were ahead in the averages, weren't they? 85 for, for Fallon over the well 11 events for her. She pulled out of the last one. Lisa Ashton, 84 average across the, the 12 events she played in all of them. And we saw during those 12 events that they were capable of throwing in the 90 averages, high 90 averages, low 100 averages in, in some cases. And, OK, yes, it is different playing on the floor to playing on the stage. But you just look at what these two players have done in the last 12 months on the stage. We saw Lisa Ashton, we go back to the start of the year, throwing the, the ton plus average against Darren Beanie in the UK Open. OK, there was no crowd there, but we saw all the, the TV cameras were there. It was a, a big achievement for more history in the ladies game. And and Fallon, as you said, getting to the final a month or so ago now in, in the World Series and playing at a top level in that final as well. 96 average she finished up with and she did come very close to winning that title as well. So, yeah, I agree without looking at the draw. It's difficult to say here and now before we even enter November that these two are going to win their first round games. But I think when you look at the, the odds when they do eventually come out for the draw, if it's a, a similar draw to what these ladies would have got in the past, I think the odds will be will be shorter for them to, to win these matches. And that just shows how far these two have come in the last year, couple of years. They have continued to improve. And Lisa, OK, yeah, she's not done as well on, on the Pro Tour as she's done in this Women's Series, but she is capable of, of throwing those big averages. And when it's a, a short format, like a, a first of three sets, she's come close before. Last year against Adam Hunt, just lost out 3-2 in that one. Fallon, we know that she can sustain that level for 
for long periods as well. So, yeah, without looking at the draw, it's hard to say they are going to do it. Maybe we'll have to come back to this one when the draw does come out. But I think just based on what we have seen from these two over the last 12 months and indeed in, in some cases on the Women's Series the last two weekends that they've played on it, they are very much live contenders in that first round draw. Now, if you look at the uh, honor roll over the course of the weekend, it looks a lot like the era de Vizier with uh, Lisa Ashton taking the role of, of, of a PSV and Fallon Shark taking the role of Ajax. But yeah, I do have to remember there is a third club in the era de Vizier that claims to be big. And once every 12 years they win a title, that's Feyenoord. And Makuru Suzuki ended the series on a high, filling the role of Feyenoord and lifting that last title how much do you think that could mean for her going into her world title defense at the lakeside i think it could mean a lot and i touched on it before i answered the last question i was going to bring up the the best in the world debate and i'll go back to one of our questions of the week january 15th 2020 we said who is the best female player in the game right now this was just after the i believe just after the world championship the bdo one and, and makuru retaining the title it might have been after q school actually as well when lisa won her tour card because the Final results, Lisa Ashton, 41%, Makuru Suzuki, 39%, and Fallon Sherrick, 17%, other 3%. So it's um, it's definitely changed since then. I think we can say that. I think we can say that Fallon and Lisa are the, the top two at the moment. Makuru is in that chasing pack. And she's kind of been the forgotten lady in darts, hasn't she, over the last year, 18 months, because she's not had a lot of opportunities to go up against the ladies or play in a lot of events that we would have seen or would have had a, a bigger audience. I know she's played quite a bit in Japan back at home. I'm sure she's still practicing and, and playing in as much as she can. But when it comes to playing your Lisa Ashton, your Fallon Sherrick, your Anastasia de Bromislovas, probably since she won that title, the, the second world title at the O2, and she uttered those now immortal words in English that she can't believe it to our producer, Hannah. We've not really seen her play too many events until this women's series come back last month. And I think that, did kind of tell in the first weekend a month or so ago. Now, I was looking back, she played across the two weekends, 42 matches, 21 in both of them. The first weekend, she had 19 averages, 79 or below, just the two averages, 80 plus. And then a month later, 21 games again, 11 matches, 79 or below, 10 matches, 80 plus. So I think the more we see her play, the more we see her start to play in more events again, I think we are going to see her start to pick up that level again and she said in the past that she wants to get a tour card, play on the PDC circuit. She may even move to the UK if she was to get that tour card. She's not just content with being the best ladies player in the game. She wants to be the best player in the world. And maybe one day we will see her on the tour. But I think, yeah, as far as her getting a title, it was important. And especially going into Lakeside in a couple of months' time, she is going to be the, the defended champion. She's won it the last two times. There will be pressure on her to try and defend that for a third time. But the best confidence you can take is from winning titles against your fellow peers. And she was able to finish off the weekend by doing that. So yeah, I think it could mean a lot. Yeah, definitely. And when I said on the last question, the two best players, I mean, right now, the two best female players are the two that are competing um, or that qualified, but Makura Suzuki, when she is match fit is absolutely in that conversation. The big thing, as you said, is we haven't seen her, and she hasn't been able to play as much. as No one has been able to play as much as they did prior to the pandemic. But the opportunities are now coming back, and be, uh, Fallon Sherrick has been thrown in at the top of the game into the World Series, into some other things recently, the Modus as well. She's a little bit more match fit, as well as not having to travel halfway across the world to compete. Um, Lisa Ashton has had the Pro Tour to go on, and it just played the Pro Tour, the leading into the women's series. So right now, Makura Suzuki is not one of the two best players in the world, but the more she plays, the more she'll get back because it really is a big three at the top. I know I joked about the uh, Eredivisie uh, thing at the beginning, and that was more just to make fun of Feinord, uh than mm -hmm. say Makura Suzuki is that far behind the top two, although in current form she might be. She's not, though, when she's at her best. And winning this title will do wonders to getting her back to there and having some confidence heading in to the women's world championship and have confidence that she can win that huge prize fund that will obviously help ease the uh, burden of traveling across the world to compete.
and help set her up for Q school. Beyond that, I don't think she needed a title, but to be able to beat Lisa Ash and to be able to play more, just not just to be able to win the title, but to be able to play in that final event at a level that was, a, okay, it wasn't at quite the level that Fallon Sherrick and Lisa Ashton were across the 11 previous events, each averaging close to or just above 85. She did average over 81 in that event and throw out the first round because obviously she didn't have, she played poorly in that match and she didn't have to do that much to win that. And she had another match where she was in the low seventies. Beyond that, she was above 80 and everything, including a match where she was well above 90. And that's more the Makuro Suzuki we remember from her two lakeside titles. The confidence will obviously help, and the experience, though, is, I think, the most important thing. I don't think she needed a title, but it definitely couldn't hurt. And she now almost certainly will be the favorite or one of the favorites heading into Lakeside as she attempts to join a very short list of players who have won three women's world titles. And now I'll move on to our next guest on this week's show. It's a player that's just qualified once again for the PDC World Championship at the end of the year. Here's our chat with Brazilian number one, Diogo Portela. I'm delighted to say I'm joined once again by Brazil's number one, Diogo Portela. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm very good. Thank you very much, Alex, for having me again. Well, this is the first time we've had you on since our 100th episode when you spoke to our colleague Matthew. That's now two and a half years ago, would you believe? How has the last two and a half years been for you? Oh, it's been tough, to be honest. Uh, Loads of uh, personal problems. Uh, uh, GP my game. But yeah, I think I'm. Uh, I'm more. I got over it, and I'm on my way up again. You know. So yeah, I'm. I'm really looking forward to the future now. Glad to hear it. Well, we have to start with this past weekend. You made the trip to Costa Rica for the Central and South America qualifier for the PDC World Championship. Obviously, it's been a difficult time around the world with the virus. But were you always confident that there would be a qualifier in South America? No, we actually uh, we we had been planning to do that last year, but um, of course because of the restrictions, we we didn't do. And um, I'm actually happy to to have done it this year because um, Costa Rica, when I went there two years ago, they showed the passion, they showed the uh, hard work, they showed everything that uh, you actually need to to become a to develop the, the sport in, in a country. So I want to see how they would uh, do in a serious tournament. And actually, the result was amazing, you know, to have one of the Chicos out of um, the Costa Ricans um, playing the final you know, was amazing for them, you know. And uh, we're probably going to do it next year in, in Costa Rica. Excellent. Well, for you personally, you've been based in the UK for a while now. What was it like getting to Costa Rica yeah. and coming back? Was it a challenge? It was. It was a challenge, to be honest, because um, actually my uh, my trip was scheduled to go through Miami and then you're so Miami, Miami closed the borders, even for connection fly. So I had to redo it again and <laughs> get uh, three flights uh, with two connections and by the end of the trip, I had been traveling for over 24 hours, you know, no, no sleep, and uh, it was quite tiring. I, I'm glad I actually went there um, four or five days before the, the tournament, so I managed to to some rest, and of course the time different, uh, seven hours from two, the UK, so um, when, uh, when it was the time to sleep here, it was lunchtime there, you know, and... It was quite difficult to um, to get feet and to get um, to get my body to work in, in that time. You know, it was really really challenging after a 24 hour trip. You know, um, but I managed to do everything right and and I actually played some really good darts over the the, the weekend. Well, the commitment certainly paid off winning that qualifier, but going into it, you've obviously flown the flag for Brazil and a whole continent in South America at the last four world championships. What was the pressure like going into the qualifier? Because I know a lot of people would have viewed you as a strong favourite to win it. Um, yeah, to be honest, this year was a year that I put actually less pressure on myself because I knew I wasn't playing right. I wasn't playing my top of my game. It wasn't, wasn't doing well. 
Uh, I didn't get decent results uh, in any kind of league that I played, mainly the online leagues. Um, but I, I, I also, I also know uh, I was working really hard to get my my game to where it belonged, and um, and I was ready for anything that that could happen. You know, um, there was some new players there that I didn't know. You know, guy from Argentina, Jesus Salati, which. Uh, uh, people hated him quite highly and I didn't know him I didn't know what's his game like and, and I don't know you know what if I win I win if I don't it, it doesn't really matter for me because I know I've been having a rubbish 18 months anyway um, but of course I wanted to win and, uh, and I did the right things at the right time and that was it you know I, we had a warm up tournament on Friday where I could um play uh, in play Salati and play uh, Norman Mandu as well which was for me the two or the favorites of the tournament and uh, I beat them uh, and that gave me an extra confidence I won the tournament which I had won in a, in a quite while and and after that I was just enjoying really enjoying the dance enjoying the moment and uh, I ended up topping the table again you know well, you mentioned a, a few names and you mentioned about Costa Rica, the darts team there. I think there are around 64 players for the, the qualifier at the weekend, eight different countries represented. What is the darts scene like in South America at the moment? Uh, to be honest, Costa Rica, um, it's been proving over and over again that it's the place for us to um, start something. They are quite solid. They have um, a quite strong um, public there. Um, with 12, 12 pubs and more than 20, 25 players in each pub playing every week um, and they are passionate for the game and they are actually close from all the central um, countries, the Caribbean countries that play darts as well in a, a little bit better level um, so um, we had after the tournament we had a meeting with the CDC uh, which he, I, I have to uh, um, thank them, uh, Peter and Jeff from CDC, um, who actually helped us running the tournament and and getting all the cities, the, all the dark connect and all the equipment we need to to provide information for you guys, um, because they they really liked what they saw as well, and we decided to start working together and see what we can do in terms of um, uh, maybe a, a tour in, in South America. It starts in Costa Rica, of course. Um, but yeah, we've got some some good things planned ahead for next year and we'll be the first year to actually um, run a, a, a tour instead of just one day qualify, you know, which, which is more like what PDC wants us to do. And we found a place to start it over. Let's see if, it, if the plans come, come along. Wow, that's great to hear. We look forward to, to that happening. And since we last spoke, we have to look a bit further back. You made history becoming the, the first player from Brazil to win a match at the PDC World Championship. What are your memories of that night, Ali Pali beating a legend in Steve Beaton? Oh, that's just... That's a memory that we'll never forget. Mainly after the um, the things that happened to me last year, but uh, I don't like to to look at the past. I think I uh, what uh, what I did is it's been done, and um, I can't change it. I just I, I think I'm more mature now when I uh, I'm looking for the future. You know, my next match is my uh, most important match, no matter if I'm playing. Uh, pub league or the, the world championship and I want to be sure I'm going to be ready for my next match and hopefully by the time I get to the world championship I'll be even better and maybe maybe win two games this year you never know you know if, but if I don't win as well uh, I, I'm okay with it I, I'm just gonna, not going to put pressure as I, I was pushing in the past on my shoulder because there uh, are things more, more important in life than a game of darts 
yeah we we saw that after the the game as well how emotional you were in, in your post-match interview you said that you spoke with alan warren a little at the pdpa and, and sporting charts how much of a help have they been for you oh they they did uh, an amazing job to be honest and they helped me a lot um but uh, you know um i i've got to give merit to myself as well because other people um in these uh circumstances they might not ask, ask for help and and i did because i knew this the situation was in was um uh, not comfortable so uh I got in touch with them. They offered me help. Um, I accepted. I did everything they uh, they asked me to do, and now I'm a, a different man, a different player. Really, you know. I know I, I still maybe ten ten percent away from my uh, from my top game uh, in terms of consistency, but I uh, I feel better in life in general, you know. So I think that will come along. Uh, to the dust match in, you know, in a few months, you know. So hopefully by December you're gonna see the best ever Diogo uh, you ever seen. Uh, let's see. That's great to hear. And you dedicated the the win to your daughter as well. I know your your family's been for a, a tough time. How is the the little one? Are you all healthy now? Yes, yes, she's fine now. She's uh, she's like a monkey climbing everything mm-hmm. and running. Uh, <laughs> back and forward uh, doesn't stop talking um, she's quite uh, quite clever so I, I'm really happy and actually they miss her it's been 10 days already without her and <laughs> I, I just want to get back home and um, enjoy the weekend with them you know uh, Ariana and Diana my wife and my daughter uh, I really miss them Happy days. Well, not long to go. Well, last one on on the last World Championship. You lost out to Glenn Durrant in the the second round. And we have to mention about when he left his darts in the board. How much banter do you give him for that? And have you tried doing it yourself? Uh, (laughs) I know it's not in football. Glenn is a nice guy, to be honest. It's just something that happened. And, you know, it's a funny thing to to remember, not something to to be upset of. And... um, uh, yeah, I, I just wish I had uh, one more day to prepare because after the emotional night the, the, the day before, uh, I just was mentally drained and I couldn't actually, I didn't have energy to, to, to play another match. If I had one more day, well, things would be different. Uh, I, I, I like to think so. Um, but yeah, about the darts, it's, it's just a joke in between us, really. And... <laughs> And that's it. Uh, nothing else. The last time we uh, saw you on stage was at the World Cup last n- month, and we saw you pay tribute to the late Kyle Anderson holding up his shirt on the stage. You two, we know that you knew each other for a little while just from that famous old picture of you two together. So, how will you remember Kyle? And can you share any memorable stories from your time with him? <laughs> there are many, many stories, but the one I'm—I mean, the moment I most like was when. Um, him and, and Tara and of course Charles came to spend two days in in my house in London, and they end up in the, <laughs> spending ten days because it was so good and we we actually had fun and we actually we have families you know uh, brothers from different mothers um, and yeah what I can say he's a guy that would move the world um, to help anyone else. And no matter who you are, no matter if you knew him or not, you just touched everyone's life. And, you know, actually it was one of the reasons that I, I moved to the UK because my plan in 2014 was actually to move to Australia to live with him and, and play in the DPA circle. But he's got his tool card and moved to the UK. So I like, uh, if he's there, let's go there then. And, you know, and the rest, the rest is history. So I actually, I've got a lot to thank Kyle and he will always be remembered uh, by me and by my family. Definitely will. Good times there. And, and a couple more before we let you go. And this is looking ahead now. We've got a couple of months before you'll be back at Ali Pali for the World Championship. What does the next couple of months look like for you darts wise? To be honest, I have, no idea. <laughs> I uh, I had everything planned uh, 
to this from the summer to to the Costa Rica qualifiers, and I know I've got the Vox show coming up end of the November. Um, but I have no idea about any other competitions. Um, I will message the guys from Oldus League to see if I can join for a week as well to have some decent uh, practice, you know. Um, but to be honest, the way the UK is, is dealing with, with all the pandemic now, um, we I basically have been playing tournaments every weekend so that that's my plan to try to play as many local tournaments as I can get wins under my belt to get the confidence back which is already coming up and and get ready for for the world championship no matter who I play I'll, I'll give my best excellent well lastly before we let you go it's going to be your fifth consecutive world championship appearance not many players without a tour card can boast that what does it mean to you to represent Brazil and, and South America in the, the biggest darts tournament there is? Well, it's a dream, isn't it? And it keeps repeating year after year. I know that one day, hopefully, there will be uh, two there. Uh, hopefully one day I can qualify through the rankings and open up another um, uh, spot for the South of America. Uh, and if it doesn't happen, I know as well that people will walk out and try to beat me, so I need to be confident. Cons- consistent, uh, consistently, how can I say, <laughs> improvement of my game, you know, and um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's just um, every year that I get up in that stage from the World Cup and the World Championship, um, it's a dream that comes true, you know, and I keep loving the games, my passion, and hopefully it can be even more. Fingers crossed for that. Well, Diogo, it's always a, a pleasure to catch up with you. We appreciate your time. Congratulations again on, on winning through the qualifier at the weekend and we wish you all the best for your next appearance of the World Championship later on this year. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex, and I appreciate your time. Thanks again to Diogo for joining us. Now we'll finish up the show with a couple more questions and firstly, looking ahead, the World Series of Darts Finals takes place this weekend in the Netherlands. Looking at the first round draw, we know that now. Which of the first round ties are you most looking forward to? And who do you think wins the title on Sunday? <laughs> There's some, there are some draws in the first round. Um, and I, I don't know where to begin. Um, you know, look uh, look at the very bottom draw. You have Kim Ibrox, who I was one of the players of the week at the Super Series, but so was Michael Smith. He won a title. He was he was the title winner we didn't talk as much about, and that was just because we had to talk about Dimitri because Dimitri was that good. But Michael Smith, it was the second title of the year, and it was just a clinical title for him. Kim Ibrex, as I said, it looks like he's back to playing near when he was playing when he was a Premier League player. How can you get a better first-round tie than that? Well, look one above it. Because you get Jose de Salsa, who's bouncing back. I mean, you, you know, he's been struggling for a few months. And by struggling, I mean he no longer looks like he's the fourth or fifth best player in the world. He looks like he's the ninth or tenth best player in the world. Well, he was starting to look like he's back near that standard that was making Premier League finals and winning a Pro Tour every other Super Series that he was at the beginning of the year. But he's going against Danny Noppert, who's – it was just a week or so ago that we were – talking about just how good Danny Noppert has become. And I've said for a long time, Danny Noppert is probably the most underrated player in world darts. I don't think he is anymore because he's finally getting some of the respect that his performances deserve. But as good as that Kim Hybrick's Michael Smith tie is, the one right above it, that Jose de Sousa, Danny Noppert one, might be even better. Uh, but what's even better than that? How about Christoph Ritaisky against Gabriel Clemens? Just two matches above that. Ritaisky has been having... We just had the question from one of our listeners last week. Is he becoming Justin Pipe in terms of not getting the Premier League nod but doing everything else? No, because he hasn't yet, but he's making quarterfinals of every televised event. But he has to go through Gabriel Clemens, who's finally playing back at that level or near that level that he was a year ago when Gabriel Clemens was looking like the next superstar in darts. has struggled a bit at times this year, but not recently. Gabriel Clemens is finally playing really well again and they have (laughs) i I don't know how to pick any of those three so i'm going to say all three of those matches because boy those are first round ties and there's a couple other matches that i don't want to miss as for who's going to lift the title 
Ooh, it's a tough one. But I just think Gurren Price is going to – He saw, assuming he's healthy. He saw Johnny, his friend, win one a couple weeks ago. Then Rob Cross lifted the European Championship. Gurren Price is going to be hungry again. Um, especially after losing out to Michael Van Guren in his last tournament in a very good match. I think he's going to want some revenge, and I think he's going to want to get that his hands on another trophy. So I'm going to go Gezi to win the World Series of Darts Finals and show why he is the world number one. And that would be a defense of the title for the Iceman if he was to get over the line. Well, for me, looking at the first round ties, you mentioned a couple that I was going to mention, and I'll mention it again, though, but Christoph Ritarski, Gabriel Clemens is one that I'm really looking forward to because you think the last time they met was at the world championship at Ali Pali and what a game it was going down to the sudden death. And we saw Gabriel miss all those match starts. I think he missed seven match starts in that last leg and Christoph got over the line on double one. It was one of the most absorbing games of darts. Okay. Not as much as in high quality in that last leg, but you just couldn't take your eyes off it. And surprisingly, this will be the first time they've played each other since then considering how often they play on the tour, that is a surprise. So I'm looking forward to seeing those two go up on stage and play each other again. Hopefully we won't have that sudden death go down to double one again. It'll be over a, in, a, in a few more darts, uh, less darts than that. Away from that, got to give a mention to the, the, the two at the top, near the top of the draw, James Wade, Mervyn King. It's just going to be their 53rd competitive meeting. They've played each other, which is uh, quite remarkable, really. But it's going to be a, a first World Series appearance for Mervyn King. He's done pretty much everything there is to do in darts apart from win a TV title in the PDC, but also play in the World Series. Well, he's going to tick that off this weekend when he goes up against James Wade. And the last one I'll give a mention to, I don't know whether it's going to be a competitive game, if it's going to be a, a, one of the, the tightest games of that opening night, the first round, but Jeffrey Desvan against Dirk Van Dijvenbode. I'm looking at the location of this event as well. It is two players that were picked as two of the invited host nation players if you like from the Netherlands to play in this event in Amsterdam one of them is on the way up Dirk van Dijvenbode very close now to breaking into that top 16 whereas Jeffrey Desvan I mentioned to him on the show last week he's heading towards dropping out the top 40 not making the world championship well he's going into this event with no pressure on his shoulders because it's a, a non-ranking event he's playing in his home country so maybe we'll see him maybe see the first signs of him coming back into some form who knows so they're my Ties I'm looking forward to from the first round. As, as far as a winner, I do like your pick with Gerwin Price, but I will have to be different. I will say he's going to get to the final, but I'm going to go with one of the four men in, in the bottom half of the draw. I'm going to go with Dimitri van der Berg to get to the final and get the better of Gerwin Price. So I'm going to go Dimitri to pick up the title. You know, I had not realized that Mervyn King had never qualified for this before. That's that's a great fact that he threw out there. I no, I had just completely missed. Um, but we'll have one more question now. Uh, the format has been announced for this year's PDC World Youth Championship as opposed to the last few years where it's been 96 players um, playing down to a final on the first day and then having a final at Minehead. All, it'll only be 32 players this year playing on one day. The final still, of course, being in between the semifinal and final at the Players' Championship final. What are your thoughts, though, on the new format? Yeah, it is an interesting one. And- Obviously, in more usual times, we'd have the last development all weekend. And sometimes I think on the same day after that last event's finished, you'd play the World Youth Championship down to the final or you'd play it the following day and you'd have 96 players. You'd have a lot of players from that development or order of merit. I think usually down to 75, 76, it goes down quite a bit. This year, though, it's going to be different, isn't it? Because they are trying to cut back on the travelling and... We saw that at the start of this year when the news came out about what was going to happen with the Challenge Tour and the Development Tour. It's going to be split between the UK and Europe to save on that travelling for the players and make it as, as viable as possible for as many players to still be able to play in the PDC system. So you, you kind of understand why they're doing it this way. I do feel for the players, as I say, 96 players down to 32 it is quite a drop. But you do feel for those players that would have got in. That's 64 players that would have missed out. And I think... Hopefully this is a format we only see as far as the number of players for for this year. And we see that go up again because it would be nice to see it still mirror the, the World Championship. 96 players in the senior one. OK, they don't have a, a group stage, but still 96 in the senior, 96 in the youth. It's got that nice symmetry about it. So hopefully we'll see that come back next year. As far as playing it on the day of the, the Players' Championship finals, I 
guess the only thing you can really say is if you see any of them tour card holders that do qualify for the players' championship finals, if they have a deep run, get to the quarterfinals, there is going to be that clash. Are they going to be able to juggle both the events on that last day? Depends on, on the TV times for their game in the quarterfinals and, of course, the semifinals and the final, and then the final in between. But are they going to be able to play both events? That's the only issue I can see there being, and the players having to choose between continuing their run in a major or trying to become a, a world youth champion. That is a decision I've never had to make. I'll never have to make uh, nowadays, but it's uh, it is a hard one for the players. But if this is something we only see for this year, then uh, then happy days. But the PDC, again, like we've said before, they've had to find a, a solution to these problems. And as they split it between the UK and Europe, I did think we would see something like this, uh, a smaller field, less travelling. But uh, hopefully next year we'll see it go back up to 96 and we'll see a lot more players get the opportunity to, to play in a World Youth Championship. Yeah, it's, especially since this is going on at my head, I, I don't fully understand the cutback to 32 players because, well, there's the facilities there and there's the room to be able to play with more players. And it would have been nice to have given more, especially being that there had, weren't as many opportunities this year to begin with because of COVID and there were fewer uh uh, youth event than normal because of COVID to be able to give the top 96 or most of them, obviously some players will have been given automatic invites and there's a few international qualifiers that come in, but to give the rest of the, however many would have been top 80 or 72 or ever many uh, would have qualified that chance to play and to do so alongside a major championship would have been a great alternative to for having to have lost out on four other events that they would have competed in in a normal year or eight other events, depending on whether you snuck in four or five weekends. Um, so I would have liked to see it stay at 96, but I do like the idea of playing the entire thing at Minehead. And that might be something to look for going on because you don't use the, what is it, the UK Open boards three through eight at the Players' Championship final, so you can do that on the Friday, or you can just start the World Youth a day early and have most of that Thursday, and then play through the knockout rounds on Friday. That way that minimizes the risk that players who qualified for both that and the Players' Championship finals are going to have to juggle two tournaments at once. But you get them, but to get those youth players to be able to play at the same venue, at the same event as the top pros i think is a great idea um not just the two that make the final but the entire field and something that if they can make work next year with a full field of 96 would be a great thing to do but i don't like to cut back to 32 i don't see why it was necessary i don't see why i don't see how it's a good thing for the game um especially when you're at a venue that can host so many more players and has and will in the future do so. Anything else for this week? As always, we've got to say thank you to our guests for joining us. Thank you to everyone for listening in. We should say as well, congratulations to good friend of the show, Kirsty Hutchinson and Cameron, uh, Cameron Menzies, both qualifying for the Lakeside this past weekend. They won the Welsh Open men's and ladies events, so they're going to be in the WDF World Championship, and we're hopefully going to have a chat with them later this week so you'll hear from them on next week's show so looking forward to bringing you those chats to you very soon our darts cast trivia congratulations dan hutchinson who was first to get the correct answer we asked who was the first player that johnny clayton beat on tv in a pdc televised event the answer was terry jenkins so congratulations to dan and here is this week's darts cast trivia courtesy of the dying nerd well, it's quiz time now on the weekly darts cast. And this week, the World Series of Darts Finals makes its return to Amsterdam. But what we want to know is where was the first staging of the tournament held back in 2015? Good luck. Thank you to Matthew for that question. Um, we'll be back next week to recap the World Series of Darts Finals and to look ahead to, I guess we now... I don't know if we ever came up with a term for October, awesome October, whatever it was. We need to come up with one for November because it's another huge month. The last few uh, Players' Championship events, as well as, of course, the Grand Slam, the Players' Championship finals, and the cutoff for the World Championship over in the PDC, uh, as well as, of course, the cutoff for the uh, World Championship 
over in the WDF as well as we get closer to the return of the lakeside just a couple months away. So let us know if uh, anyone you want on will continue to try to get people who qualified for the TV events across all the codes and darts, uh, as well as looking ahead to those events themselves. Until then, uh, hang tight. Um, won't be that much time to hang tight for much longer as we're almost there, almost to darts mess. Uh, but we still have to hang tight for another month.